Uh, oh, that seems to be working. Okay. Yeah, the the mic didn't seem to be working there. So I'm going to repeat all that, and I hope that you've um, I hope that you uh, are still watching. <laughs> so yeah, just saying that um, I've got work in a, in an exhibition in Edinburgh, and the purpose of this live stream is to talk through some of the works that are in that exhibition. Um, I've the plan was that I'd be in the gallery surrounded by the prints, but we're having some difficulties with the technology there. So um, so I, I, I've rushed home and I'm doing the live stream from home. This is my living room and that's my dog on the sofa there. So there's a chance she might get up and, uh, and have a wander around. Um, I'm hoping she doesn't bark, but uh, if somebody comes to the door, then she might. But uh, yeah, I've got um, some prints on a presentation to show you and I'm gonna talk you through those. So a little bit of an introduction first. So um, I guess I might have a couple of different audiences here. That's because I've got a, a couple of different like artistic online personas. Um, so one is um, I have a YouTube channel here where I uh, do art tutorials. Um, so drawing exercises, um, it's like painting houses, street scenes, that kind of thing, um, and some um, and some like watercolor tutorials, like how to paint patterns. I love like really simple patterns, and uh, yeah. Um, so thank you, thank you, Lindsay. I'm, I'm glad the audio has just come on. That's great. Um, yeah. So I've, I've got that kind of um, that kind of side of things that I do. So you may be watching because you've seen some of those things, um, but I also I have a, a, a side of my um, of my artistic career where I'm a fine art printmaker. So I mainly make screen prints, uh, but some lino prints and some other types of printmaking. And I um, I exhibit those. Um, I usually kind of um, exhibit them in group shows. I um, submit them to artist societies and um, and I do print fairs and, and those kind of things. Um, and the works look slightly different, although you should be able to see some commonalities. So things like I, I really like geometrics, I really like geometric patterns, and I really like gold. So that tends to be common between the two. Um, the work that I'm exhibiting um, is a combination of different things. So there's um, there's work that I've I've been doing kind of going back maybe up to I think the, the oldest one in the in the exhibition is about seven years old. Uh, and there's all sorts of different themes on there. Um, there's quite a lot of abstract work, so uh, I really like kind of circles and geometric patterns. And you're going to see some work in a second, so so hold on to that. And um, yeah, I um, uh, but yeah, for the last about four and a half years, I've been working on a PhD, and it's not a normal kind of PhD. It's a creative practice PhD. So. What that means is that I do I do research and I do research a topic, but uh, what I'm submitting at the end of it is a kind of portfolio of creative work around a subject, and so um, quite a few of the prints in the exhibition are prints that I've made for that project. The a uh, the PhD is actually in theology, and I'm doing it through Glasgow University, and um, through the theology. The, excuse me through the Theology and Religious Studies department. Uh, but um, I'm particularly focused on like the ethics of economics. Um, and a little bit of background is that um, I, I'm, um, I'm part of, well, I'm a member of the Methodist Church and that's kind of been something that's been quite important to me for a long time. And uh, through, uh, through, through being part of that church and kind of um, um, spending a little time studying theology, um, I, I became really aware of um, the importance of kind of addressing economics as a topic um, and how much, uh, how much of, um, yeah, how much of life is affected by economic decisions and how much people's kind of quality of life is affected by that as well. Um, how it plays into everything that um, there is, um, 
yeah, so there's parts of my work that are thinking about debt, about kind of human trafficking, about modern slavery and about climate change. So um, all of those things are kind of part and parcel of it. And um, I, uh, I think it's probably about time that I showed you some of the uh, some of the works and talk you through them. Uh, so I'm going to switch to the presentation mode now and uh, let's see if we can see some of the, uh, the prints. Okay. There we go. I'm just going to wait for to see if that shows up on the screen. I've got a little bit of a delay, just a few seconds. So I'm going to keep talking while that's happening. But yeah, I think that's working. Okay, good. So the first prints that I made in this series kind of look very different to everything else. I mainly work abstract, but every few, well, once every six months or so, I feel the need to make something representational which is more to kind of prove to myself that I can uh, rather than anything else, I think. And I made a series of really quite small screen prints uh, based on studies of shells. These were shells that I picked up off the beach at North Queen's Ferry and they're um, periwinkles, I think. Uh, but they've been ground down and worn away by the sea as the, uh, as the waves wash them in and out and as the tides rise and fall. Uh, the the kind of the distinctive shape of the shell gets worn away and you're left with the kind of these little bits of like twisted shell that are just fragments of uh, of what was there originally and i wrote this poem to go along with it so i hope you'll indulge me if i reading this out i hope you'll indulge me if i read this out run from the car over the dunes through the grasses that sting your legs to the white sand beach. The sea is waiting for us, cold and green on a blue sky day. We are not concerned with the expanse of it, only the white foam fringes. A pause to make preparations. Removal of shoes, trousers, behind a towel if you need to. How far will we venture? The mental preparation too takes time. The cold freezes the mind before the skin. Adjust. This is safe. Though every step needs careful planning, avoiding jellyfish and sharp stones. Stand still and feel the pull of the receding sand at your feet. They are quickly buried in the wash. Jumping the waves as they arrive is a game we play and always lose, laughing. We can't outrun the sea. Later, I encountered a different sea. Swimming on a surface beach, the sea was blue, warm and inviting, and it surged. The ocean's heartbeat more, more visible here. To swim in it was euphoric, rocked in bountiful arms. I loved and she loved in return. She was unconcerned as waves broke over me. The first a game, the same I played in the North Sea. The second a joy, but soon two, three, four came too fast and I was far too down and I lost my way back up. She offered to embrace me, take her to herself, drag me under and away. I slipped her grasp and loved her more from a distance. I can still taste the salt. I remember being in my early 20s and learning to navigate um, debt for the first time. The first credit card I had had a limit of £500 and it was wondrous. It was fabulous. It allowed me to, on a very low salary, uh, to do things like uh, attend my cousin's wedding in New York and to buy a table that um, I'm still using today. Um, it was able to cushion the blow of unexpected payments and expenses. But I very quickly learned to be wary of it because if you can pay the balance off every month, that's absolutely fine. But if you can't, the amount it grows is just scary. And 
I understood like how interest works. I knew I knew what I signed up for, and I, I knew I knew that was going to happen. But the experience of it was something very different. And during that period, uh, which for me was very short, and and kind of easily got past, there was a period where I really began to fear. Like every payday was a relief because you could breathe in again, but then quickly you felt overwhelmed again. I felt that um, I felt that I was really struggling, but now I realise that actually, actually I was doing absolutely fine. I had a safety net. I had family I could turn to if I needed help, and I had. Um, and I had an awareness that this was dangerous. Quickly, I found uh, a better playing job. I found my footing again, and and yeah, all was all was okay. But that experience of, of debt is is horrendous for some people, and it's really scary and it's really quick. Uh, the way that it can take you over. Um, I'm, I've been reading a lot in part of the research for the PhD, and uh, one of the things that I read was um, from Yanis Varoufakis, who was the uh, Greek finance minister, um, and he's written a bit about his experience uh, during the time after the 2008 crash, uh, when the whole country was in debt. And he uses this term of fiscal waterboarding, a deliberate and sustained process of escalating the amount of debt um, and the pressure from increasing those debts every month. And then they would be relented just enough to be able to pay. And then the, and then the net would tighten again and again and again. That sense of feeling helpless and out of control. And that's what I wanted to get across with these images of the shells taken from the beach. I felt that um, the original shells had been little homes, really secure and well designed. But the effect of the tide over time, uh, just the way that they were worn down to fragments, and that little drip 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 of pressure and worry, anxiety. The way that I made the prints was that I took photos. So I took the shells from the beach and I brought them home and I used my macro photography lens to take really close up photos of them to get all the detail in. And then I blew the photos up large and I worked from them in detail, stippling all the dark areas. With a, with a pen. Worked on tracing paper um, so that I could turn these into screen prints. And then I created another layer, which is the kind of beigey colour behind, just with the, the areas of shadow and the backgrounds. So these are really quite small prints and they were just the first start on my journey. The next ones that I produced I produced two prints that I've called Devour, and I know it's a really weird kind of title uh, for a print. Um, this came from some of my reading about um, theological ethics and economics, and I had a moment where I was reading a book called Covenant Economics by Richard Horsley, and uh, he's talking about a little bit in, um, in Mark's Gospel. And I've, like, I've read this loads of times. I thought I knew it. Um, but Jesus is at the temple. He's addressing people. He's doing teaching. And it's kind of quite controversial. And he's really being quite... Um, yeah. He's being quite um, con confrontational. That's it. Um, and he says this. Um, So yeah, so this is from Rich, from Horsley's book. Said, um, 
The second of Jesus' accusations against the scribes comes at the end of his confrontation with the Jerusalem rulers and their representatives in the temple. He warns people, beware of the scribes who, among other offences, devour widows' houses. They will receive the greater condemnation. Their actions are tantamount to coveting and stealing widows' livelihood on behalf of the temple. In the very next episode, a widow proceeds to give everything she had, all she had to live on, that is, her household and inheritance, to the temple, thus illustrating Jesus' charge. In the following episode, Jesus declares that the temple in which the scribes are based will be destroyed. I read that and I just had a moment of what? Because that bit with the widow, that little that little vignette, I've I've heard it loads of times and I I've I've heard sermons on it, I've heard people using it. And every single time they talk about the uh the widow's faith. A great faith in giving to God and giving to the temple, even though she had very little to live on. And I had to go and check because that wasn't actually what it said. It doesn't mention anything about her faith or her reasoning. It's just that happened. So I made this couple of I made this couple of prints. Um, and it made me think that, like the, if you're watching a film and you saw that, uh, that scene, um, with, uh, somebody, uh, making a speech, condemning somebody else and mentioning they devour widow's houses. And then the very next scene, it cuts to a woman wearing black coded as a widow well, wouldn't you think actually maybe these things are related? I, I've come to read that uh, little bit very, very differently. But one of, the, one of the things about biblical studies is that people always argue about the meanings for things. Um, so I don't think you need to have the same uh, the same reading of it as me to to appreciate that uh, there are there are pressures on people because of money and the two prints that I've got here about those pressures uh, I've done two kind of copper circles uh, made with copper ink and they're cracked and fractured and all around the outside of them is kind of my linear interpretation of chaos and pressure so chaos in the black lines and pressure press it, i'm imagining it kind of pressing inwards onto the circle and then inside the circle i've drawn little fine lines that undulate and these are lines i use in lots of drawings and they tend to mean um so where i've drawn it like this i've um i've i've drawn the lines kind of moving around the circle but they kind of move around all of the obstacles so i've created these like obstacles these intrusions into the circle but the lines inside the circle move around them and they are a sense of resilience in the face of pressure i don't know whether these circles are going to crack and fracture and break irreparably or whether the resilient center is going to make the difference but I made them in a sense of a sense of anger at the ways in which uh, people's lives are out of their own control. Uh, a sense of anger at the at external pressures that drive people into debt and destitution, and a sense of lament, a, a sadness at the the way that. Uh, often we feel helpless in the in the face of it and helpless to do anything about it. So that's what these two are about. So I'm just having a look, seeing if there's any questions or anything, and I don't see there that there are. So um, 
if you do have any questions while you're going on, um, put them in the chat and I will uh, try and address them at the end. I've got a couple more prints I want to show you. Um, and they're getting more positive. <laughs> so the first ones are kind of about anger and lament at the kind of state of things. And then I start to think about how things can change. And uh, for this uh, print here, um, I started uh, working uh, more with uh, the patterns that are um, these little wiggly lines, essentially. Uh, the way that I make these is that I start, for this one, I started at the bottom of the page and I drew a straight line and I used a ruler as a guideline for that. Uh, and then I draw another line on top of it. And then I draw another line on top of that. And at each point, at each stage of drawing that line, all I'm trying to do is to try and keep the gaps the same. This is my like way of trying to like create straight parallel lines by giving myself a set of rules that, if perfectly followed, should give you a nice straight, perfectly parallel set of lines. But because I'm a human, I'm a, I'm a human machine, um, and I, that's a complex machine, and because I'm working on a physical piece of paper with a physical pen, and I'm not a computer and I'm not a robot, I make little skips and wibble, wibbles, wibbles with the line, wobbles. And at the first, in the first few lines, they're tiny. Um, but as I draw more and more and more lines, they become more pronounced. And they become more, uh, more obvious and they become like a, a pattern that repeats itself across the page. So I, um, I made this print because I wanted to question how to change things. So it seems like it seems like financial institutions and governments and um, and and things are like set on a course, and it seems very difficult to to change those systems once they're started. Um, and I wanted to kind of think about different ways of affecting change. So I started with the patterns that I'm making. Like I find it really difficult to change them or to stop uh, once I've begun and I can just carry it up to the end of the page but I don't, I don't know how to change it, I don't know how to, how to stop it once I've got it started. So for this one I decided that I was going to try and change it in the centre of the, of the picture. So I, uh, I drew myself a circle and I ruled lines across the circle. So while I'm drawing outside the circle I'm following that pattern of trying to keep the lines the same distance apart by referring to the line below. When I reach the centre of the circle, I trace the line across, trying to keep with the ruled lines, using the ruled lines as a guideline instead. And then it found I found that actually the transition was sometimes a little bit awkward, but actually it was easier than I thought to change a pattern. Interestingly, I made a, a new version of this um, last, last year after COVID um, because I'd seen that um, something major comes along and actually it is possible to make change, to affect change. But I did wonder what happens when that kind of bubble closes and that window of opportunity is gone. Does the, does the change stay after that? Does it make a difference? I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. It took a long time to do the drawing for this. Um, I did it over several days. Um, and then I realized when I was maybe about halfway up it, that I was thinking more about climate change and asking questions about whether it's possible to make changes to our way of life to, uh, in order to address climate change. The pattern outside the circle 
kind of represents like ingrained habits, ways of thinking, uh, ways of understanding that we are kind of like stuck in, like you get stuck in a rut. So I want to know like what happens, what happened, what do we need to make changes? What kind of mindset shifts do we need to make? What are the rules? And when I say rules, I don't mean like the government rules. I mean like the societal rules that we need to to think about how to change. And what are the guidelines should, that we should draw? Will guidelines help us? And how do we how do we stick to them? So that's what this prints about. So hi Laurie, hi from Canada. I'm just going through some of the prints that I've made um, over the last few years and talking about them. And uh, yeah, um, I've got I've got one or two more to go. Uh, yeah, so this one, yeah, I think two more. This one is called Seven by Seven. Um, and it starts with a little circle. Um, and in the center of the circle, I draw little loops. They're, they look a bit like an Elizabethan rough, um, but I've had this print like compared to knitting or crochet or something like that before. Uh, but this loopy pattern uh, is really interesting because it, it's formed in the same way as the lines in the previous picture. So I start with the, the central circle and then I draw a pattern of loops beyond that. And my rule is that the uh, the bottom of the loop in the second circle uh, should be where the gap in the two loops is in the top. Um, Mag wants to know how big is seven by seven? Um, so yeah, the print is, um, I think it's 40 by 50 centimeters. So, uh, so yeah, and it's on 50 by 60 centimeter paper. I don't know what that compares to in inches, um, but um, so yeah, is is forty centimeters about sixteen inches, something like that. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so it's about that size. So um, so yeah, so the central circle is maybe about fifteen centimeters across, something like that. Does that help? Um, so yeah, so the, the pattern of loops is that my rule for making this, this pattern is that the uh, when I'm drawing a loop, the bottom of the loop hits the point where the, there's a gap in the two loops of the row below. So there should be the same number of loops in each, in each row. Now I know that if I continue this pattern, it actually does something really interesting. It, um, it, it starts to morph so that um, some of the loops get really big because they're inheriting the properties of the loops in the previous row. So they start to, uh, so loops that are slightly bigger on the next row become a little bit bigger and then a little bit bigger again and a little bit bigger again. Uh, loops that are slightly smaller um, tend to kind of get squished um, so they become smaller and smaller and smaller as the pattern works out from the center. Um, over time, those loops kind of get eaten. And I was thinking about the way that the widow's house was devoured. Um, the, the little privileges of, of space in, in, in the terms of this pattern uh, grow and they become forceful and they start to kind of eat away at the loops in the row below. So if you continue this pattern without ever resting it, you end up with, um, with a very small number of huge loops, like maybe four or five. And I've done this in a number of different kind of, number of different drawings and a number of different ways. And I always end up with like four or five big loops. And it really struck me that, um, yeah, the uh, the the way that um, financial kind of uh, uh, inequalities tend towards uh, monopoly 
so um and you do tend to get like a big four or a big five of something like a like a big four accountancy firms something like that um and they tend to kind of eat away at the competition so i felt this was a good kind of like a visual metaphor for that kind of thing so in this particular print what i've done with that is that um i have counted seven loops and then i've reset the pattern so i've drawn I've, I've, I've ignored my rule on the seventh row through. So I've just drawn the little loops. So um, so every seven rows, I reset the number of loops in the circle and then allow it to expand from there. And what this does is it really limits that tendency to expand to four or five uh, kind of monopolies. The reason I chose seven, seven by seven, and 49 for the total is again because of the biblical references, this time in the Hebrew scriptures. They come from the sense of um, having uh, regular Sabbaths. So uh, uh, every seven years would be a Sabbath year where you didn't plough your fields. And in Deuteronomy, um, there's a, um, a sense that debts should be forgiven and um, slaves um, should be returned to their families after seven years. But every 49 years would be a jubilee year, and a jubilee year was a, a year where all debts should be reset. Um, and, uh, um, and yeah, all debts would be forgiven, and people who were in debt bondage uh, because of outstanding debts could go home to their families. And I thought it was interesting to look at that as a a kind of a numerical model um, for a kind of a debt relief or a debt amnesty and to think about whether debt amnesties might be a thing that could um, help us deal with future financial crises. In this I'm helped by thinking um, the thinking of an economist called Michael Hudson. Um, he's written a book called And Forgive Them Their Debts. Uh, which looks at, it looks at the biblical material, but he's also looking at uh, what was done about debt in ancient Near Eastern cultures, so um, Sumeria, uh, places like that. And, uh, um, and he's saying that uh, debt amnesties were really, really quite popular and they were really, um, they, they were used quite frequently and it was usually after like a new ruler had uh, acceded the throne or after a big victory or something like that, they would say, OK, all debts are off. Um, and any land that's familial land that's been kind of forfeited due to debts should be returned to their families, uh, the, the families that originally farmed them. And uh, and um, and and yes, his argument is that that was a way of stabilizing uh, those ancient economies. But what was different um, in the Hebrew scriptures was that uh, it took it out of the hands of the rulers who could use it as a kind of political tool. But and, and it became uh, it became kind of numerically based, like this is going to happen um, every 49 years. This is going to happen. Um, so uh, there's obviously a lot of conversation and a lot of debate about whether that actually happened, whether it happened in practice. Um, and that's something that I don't really know the answer to, but I thought it was a, it was an interesting visual metaphor to explore through this print. So that's what this one's about. Oh, I'm going to go back. That's it. So I made this series of three prints. There's actually this is one of them, and there's three in the series that are all look pretty much the same, to be honest. Um, and again, this is using these like wiggly lines, but this time I wanted to uh, look at ways that I could create a visual model of economics that might help me think about uh, the ways that um, a contemporary economic system might function. Um, I was inspired by a book called Utopia for Realists uh, by Rutger Bregman, and this looks at it starts by looking at the history of like utopian ideas, so about like perfect societies um, and perfect communities and the ideas that people have had about that, but also looks at the ways that they can be, they can actually be useful rather than just like pie in the sky dreaming. 
Um, and uh, he says that there's actually, you, you kind of want to reject like the idea of this like utopian blueprint, but, um, but the utopian ideas can have a usefulness in themselves. Uh, he looks at contemporary Western capitalism and suggests that a utopian idea might offer a realistic solution for equal, no, unequal and unhappy nations. Um, so for this one, I used those lines again, again, starting from the bottom and working up. And then this time, every 12, I um, created a, a line of gold. And that's just to give you a sense of the differences in the different parts of this drawing. Um, for the first like third of the drawing, I'm kind of, kind of following the same pattern as I did with the uh, with the, the the print called change, the one with the gold circle in the centre that I showed you just a minute ago. Um, I'm trying to make the differences between every line the same, uh, but they they magnify over time and form these little ripples and patterns. Um, and then I just, all I did was change my focus. So I started thinking what would be a good way of thinking about kind of financial deregulation. And I started thinking, well, okay, if I, if I ignore what's happening with the rest of the lines, I only concentrate on the peaks. So I'm only worried about whether the peaks of the um, of the of the little undulations are as high as the uh, the peak before. The effect that has is to kind of magnify those peaks, and they begin to expand, and you can see um, the differences between the highs and lows become really quite extreme. I see that as like a model for uh, more unequal societies. And then about, um, about a third of the way from the top, I decided to change my focus to the opposite. So instead of worrying about the peaks, I'm not worried about them at all. They can do whatever they like. I'm only gonna be worrying about what happens in the troughs, so the low points. And all I want to do is to make sure that the low point is as, um, is as far from the line below it as, uh, as, as the one previous. What happened really surprised me in that the drawing almost completely leveled out. So there are still like one or two peaks and troughs, but that pattern of inequality almost completely disappears. The book focuses on an idea of uh, a universal basic income. Uh, and looks at different research um, proposals and uh, projects that have been uh, done into basic income. And I could see that um, focusing less on uh, what's happening like at the top of the market and more about um, making sure that um, everybody has a kind of a good and comfortable standard of living um, is the focus of that kind of basic, basic income idea. Um, what really surprised me about this print was that uh, was that um, just by focusing on the low points on the troughs, the the whole the whole drawing completely leveled out, and that had a real impact on my thinking on this topic as well because I had been thinking previously that um, that a real way to arrest financial inequality was um, by paying attention to what the extremely wealthy are doing and by trying to um, by trying to kind of lower the uh, the the differences by bringing the top of the market down but now I'm thinking actually maybe that's not the important thing maybe by focusing on a good quality of life and a release from anxiety, um, from the pressures of debt um, for all, like across the board, then maybe that would have the effect of lowering inequality as well. So that is, <laughs> that's, that's 
an artist talk that comes with like a reading list. Um, it may be more than you were expecting today, but I hope that it's been enjoyable. Um, I, I've got a little bit of time for questions, so if you have any uh, questions about uh, the works that I've presented today, then put them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that you've uh, found, I hope that you've enjoyed this and found it helpful. I'm going to come back on screen now. Oh, there we go. Okay, a little bit of di little bit of um, a hiatus while I change the screens over. But yeah, right, I'm back. I'm back facing you all. So yeah, if you've got any questions, then do let me know. And I will see what I can do. Can't promise to answer everything. So yeah, so it's been quite an interesting experience putting on an exhibition, and uh, uh, yeah, I can chat about this while I'm waiting for some questions to come up. Uh, it's got um, it's got a fair few challenges, um, kind of finding a space and um, having all the work framed and presented, and then uh, and then I've been trying to work out how to present some of the ideas in it as well. Uh, for some of these, I've um, I've actually printed out some little summaries of the kind of the bits of the talk that I've been giving you today and uh, and and sharing those in the gallery. It's useful to be able to talk to people like in real life about it but I also wanted a chance for uh, people online and in other parts of the world to be able to engage with uh, some of those ideas as well. So that was the idea behind doing the artist's talk online so I hope it's been helpful. Oh, I've got a couple of questions now or comments. Yes. Thank you both to Mag and Lindsay. Thank you for watching today and thank you for your comments. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> Mag says it's not as easy when you try to do them yourself. Um, so yeah, I, um, I think part of this is, part of the experience for me has been about like learning who I am as an artist and like rejecting the, uh, the things that aren't of me. So um so yeah so don't get yourself down if you can't like do work like I'm doing because there's lots and lots of different ways of producing artwork there's lots of different mediums there's lots of different um yeah th there's lots of um yeah there's lots of um ways to express yourself that's it um so yeah so you don't you don't have to copy what I'm doing um and uh but yeah, but if you do want to try it, you should know that I've been drawing like this for years and it didn't like start as easy as this. And if you look at some of my sketch work, um, it can be a lot more awkward um, and it does take a little bit of time and practice uh, to, to get it. So don't beat yourself up if you're not kind of getting the same results as I am. It, it does just take time like anything. So yeah, a couple more. I'm wondering if your images, metaphors and parables extend into other areas of human experiencing too. Um, do you think economics is perhaps only one expression of the underlying informational and energetic nature of inequalities of power? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, yeah, picked economics because it's one thing that you can kind of get a handle on. Uh, but I think there's an awful lot going on and, and you find that as soon as you start digging into it, you suddenly go, oh yeah, but the, there's obviously like resonances with um, like um, different social theories with, uh, with uh, you know, racism, with, uh, with, with gender inequalities and, and these things are all interlinked um, and it's very hard to, to kind of separate things out. Um, 
it's yeah so yeah you could you could pick anything I think you could pick any topic and dig into it and you'd find like you'd find links to other areas um and uh yeah I yeah one of my questions that uh people keep asking me in the gallery is like what are you doing next and I'm like I don't know I don't know I don't know what I'm going to do next um I might look into economics some more and I might dig a bit more into it but actually I'm thinking uh there are so so many other areas of uh like human interest that I'd like to be able to explore so um so yeah so there's I think there's no end of topics So I'm going to wait another few seconds and see if any more questions come through. But uh, yeah, if they um, if they don't, then it's been wonderful sharing this with you today. I really hope it's been helpful. And uh, yeah, I don't know whether like a, a book list, uh, whether I should put a big bibliography in the description or something. But if that's something that uh, you'd like, then I can do that and put links to the books that I've been reading in there. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'm going to call it a day. And uh, yeah, I, I really want to thank you for, uh, for watching. And uh, yeah, if you've got any further questions, so if you're watching this, like after the stream has ended, uh, you can still put questions down in the description or any comments or anything. And uh, I will, I will, I will do my best to address them. I can't promise to answer them. It depends what they are. Um, if it's about what ink I'm using to screen print, then that's an easy one to answer. Like, if it's about, um, yeah, if it's something kind of detailed about economics, then I might have to look it up. So we'll see. So, yeah, so thank you very much. And I, um, yeah, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure when my next video is going to be. Um, it's going to be very different to this, I'm fairly sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to take a week off after the exhibition and, uh, and then I'll be back with more uh, tutorial videos on this channel. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to, to getting back to doing that and, uh, I look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Okay. Well, thank you all. Okay. Goodbye.